This episode of the Human Experience Podcast is brought to you by Find Mindfulness. Mindfulness these days is huge. Mass media is starting to understand the benefits of taking time to pause and reflect. Have you ever been interested in mindfulness and meditation? Have you ever wanted to create a practice, but you just fall off track? Well, this is where Find Mindfulness comes in. They offer a community that will help you create those powerful lasting habits that keep you training your mind. Whether you are the CEO of a Fortune 500 company or a college student running a startup, Find Mindfulness can help you. Find Mindfulness is a 30-day program. How often are you looking at your cell phone? Just ask yourself how often you look at your cell phone and then tell yourself that you need to take this course. Mention the human experience. Go and sign up right now at www.findmindfulness.com. What's up, folks? This is our episode with Mr. Simon G. Powell. In it, we get into the history of psilocybin and its influences on history and culture. We talk about reconnecting with the biosphere, biomimicry. So it's certainly one of those wide ranging conversations. I certainly recommend you check out Simon's work. I found his book, Darwin's Unfinished Business, especially interesting. He's also got a couple books out on psilocybin. You can order copies of those below. Otherwise, please get to us on social media. I try my best to keep things updated there. Uh, we are in the process of getting giving the site a cleaner look. So I spent some time this weekend working on that for you guys. Yeah. Find us on Facebook, Twitter, at The Human XP. Subscribe to our YouTube channel. Please spread the podcast out as much as you possibly can, word of mouth style. I mean, I think that people love this show. The only thing that is stopping us is that people just haven't heard it yet. So if you're sitting on sending me an email, don't hesitate. I do my best to respond to those. We've got a stack scheduled through March. Some really intriguing authors. We are full steam ahead, folks. Thank you guys so much for listening. The Human Experience is in session. My guest tonight is Mr. Simon G. Powell. His book is The Mushroom Explorer. Simon, welcome to HXP. Yeah, nice, nice to have. Thanks for having me on. So, Simon, your your work surrounds this sort of idea of psilocybin mushrooms and their insights, and you've created a couple books on this. I mean, what sparked this interest for you and how did you get into this? That's a good question. Why would anyone spend their adult life uh, investigating a substance that's considered, that's classed as uh, Schedule 1 in America, Class A in the, the UK? There's always taboo around it. Um, yeah, I became interested in psilocybin as I suppose many people do because the effects are so interesting. Uh, anyone who's interested in uh, consciousness and the uh, potential realms of consciousness and what I would argue are authentic spiritual experiences and I spiritual in in inverted commas um, you're going to eventually be led to to plants and substances like psilocybin to, to psychedelic substances and I think approached in the right way with care and caution they can lead to very illuminating experiences and it's because I had a number of illuminating experiences garnered, uh, deriving from, I should add, from mushrooms that grow in the country in which I live in, here in the UK. 
you know, I never, no money was ever exchanged. This is a, a natural resource that grows every autumn in the UK. So it was, it was a case of exploring this free natural resource from this uh, generous uh, biosphere in, on which, in which, within which we live. Um, it was through the, the, those kind of uh, nature-based experiences with, with a naturally occurring resource that uh, inspired me and I've stuck with it for about 25 years because it's interesting. So, I mean, what, what, was, what was the conclusion of some of your research? I mean, because I've read, read some articles and this is becoming, I think, more commonplace that these studies that are coming out that say that uh, psilocybin is able to repair brain tissue, it's helping with PTSD. I mean, there are these ongoing things that seem to be coming up where psilocybin is helpful. So what is your take on that? Well, yeah, there's been a resurgence in um, scientific research with psilocybin, particularly over about the last five, ten years. I've recently interviewed some of the main researchers in America. And yeah, psilocybin is, is proving to be a, a very useful therapeutic tool. Um, primarily, there it's being used to alleviate anxiety in people suffering from terminal cancer. Um, but it's also being looked at as a therapy to treat... Um, well, in Alabama, I recently met a guy, a recent scientist uh, from Alabama who's doing research. He's looking at um, using psilocybin to treat cocaine addiction. So you can imagine if they get... That's going to get a lot of... Uh, headlines if, if they get positive results from that it's been so it's been used successfully in, in various therapeutic um, settings to cure addictions and to alleviate anxiety and to alleviate obsessive compulsive disorder and this kind of thing I mean if you if you recognize that this compound has benefits why do you think it's illegal well I think that's probably a leftover from the I, I questioned a lot of the scientists about this, why, why it is illegal. Um, there's a whole, there's a load of uh, reasons for that, mainly because of what happened in the the 60s. And um, it, and then there's a fear of sort of the, the losing control, control of the populace or something. There's an unfounded fear. So there's an unfounded fear because it, it's an aspect, these, these psychedelic agents... Uh, they, they cause to emerge a, a, an unusual uh, potential within the human psyche and unusual kind of exotic experiences. And we're not, we're, they're, they're alien to, to sort of modern culture, although older cultures manage to integrate these substances. So there's a lot of fear there because we're basically afraid of ourselves. We're afraid, we think it's like Pandora's box rowing, but I don't think we need to ha have fear. Um, but yeah, it's a... It's a, it's a it's a slow integration process. Um, they're, they're, cl they're, cl they're, they're accorded a, a Schedule One or Class A status because they're believed not to have. They're believed to be extremely harmful, which is not true. They don't, they're not. They're not. A, psilocybin is not addictive. It's not killed anyone, um, and they're considered not to have any medical utility. Well, that's been proven wrong recently because papers have been published showing the medical utility. So things are set to change in the, in the next uh, ten years, I think. Right. I mean, you, you live in England, God save the Queen, but uh, do you find that the perception in England is different as far as the usage of these compounds? Do you find it's different there versus in the States? Well, the, the situation, until 2005, the situation with psilocybin, it was different than America. In, until 2005, it w in the UK, it was legal to pick and possess uh, unprocessed psilocybin mushrooms and that that people have been using them for about 30 years it was only in 2005 they were um, the fresh mushroom was illegalized but um, yeah I mean the situ the, the situation with with the drug situation in the UK is pretty much the, the same as in the USA It's like a zero to alcohol is fine tobacco is fine but anything else any other change in consciousness is deemed uh, to be a criminal offense you know so it's it's just as crass here the situation with drugs as it is in america although although i was recently in it like i said i was recently in america and i was in colorado actually and uh, yeah i mean they've they've um legalized cannabis there now so i think that you know that, that you're one step ahead in and you got to wonder why something so readily available alcohol which turns most people into complete asshats is 
legal and these compounds that kind of expand your consciousness make you think of, you got to wonder why you know that that exists so moving on here um you in your book magic mushroom explorer you talk about you mentioned Ter- terence mckenna and you talk about how kind of bringing the experience in using the darkness and silence how have you found that affects the experience well, I talk about in my book that originally I, Terence McKenna always said you should take psilocybin in silent darkness. And I used to do that in the, the early 90s. But from the sort of mid 90s onwards until now, I found it's just as interesting. My, my preferred mode of taking psilocybin is out in nature in like a, a wild oak forest far from the uh, from cities and far from from uh, civilization and to take mushrooms that have been picked locally to take them around a campfire with a close friend with you know with eyes open some of the time and exploring the forest and exploring nature and um and bonding with nature so i think that um, methodology is just as rewarding and just as uh, uh, um, as interesting as taking it in silent darkness. So I don't think there are any set rules. You know, there's uh, the most important thing is set and setting to be in the right environment and to have the right frame of mind and the right intention. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You on your website, you describe yourself as having a case of chronic biophilia, which is an awareness and love of the instinctive bond between you, yourself and other living systems. What? What does that mean exactly? <laughs> well, uh, it's just me joking when I say I suffer from chronic biophilia. I've had people write to me and say, oh, are, you, are you okay now? You know? um, no, it's just a joke. It's, it's uh, British humour. Um, but, but, but because of all these uh, adventures I had out in the Lake District and Snowdonia, the last, in all these, the last remaining wilderness areas in the UK where the mushroom grows and where I like to trek around and pick them and take them in situ, um, you really commune with nature. If you're in a forest, you really feel the kind of wisdom within the, within the forest. And if the stars are out, it, it's fantastic. And the sound of running water and looking at the trees and the insects and hearing birds and all this kind of thing, it really stimulates biophilia. And we, we, you've got to remember, we live in a time where there's a what they call nature deficit disorder because we've become so urbanized we've lost touch with the biosphere you know much to the biosphere's detriment as, as we're learning with with uh, as we're feeling the effects of this nature deficit disorder so i mean as a tool for for addressing nature deficit disorder and um catalyzing biophilia which we need i think um you know psilocybin is is uh, it's a it's a great tool for doing that so um yeah chronic biophilia that's just when your biophilia just gets ramped up to really high levels and you know you feel like you're in love with with the biosphere you know so do you feel do you feel like you're interacting with the plants and their consciousness in some way the global consciousness i've written a lot about the what i call the paradigm of natural intelligence i think you can interact and feel and sense that there's an intelligence within nature within living organisms within biologic but i don't tend to see that as a conscious intentional intelligence as such i see it as a, an unconscious intelligence but it doesn't even if i say it's an unconscious intelligence it's still replete with wisdom and the whole point is is that we can learn from life and we can learn from ecosystems and we can learn about symbiosis and try and incorporate that into human culture so uh, but there's there are different interpretations of what um of of this intelligence which is undoubtedly within within the the biosphere Hmm. okay well in your book um the psilocybin solution which i think you wrote after mushroom explorer right no, no, psilocybin solution was uh, quite a long, more, long way back. In oh, the- okay, uh, my apologies. So, so in psilocybin solution, you talk about the role of psilocybin and uh, mushrooms and the, the history of our culture and the connection these creatures and organisms create around us. I mean, how, how did you get into that? Can you tell us more about that, please? Well, it's got a long. It's the, the the history of the mushroom is fascinating because it's been used in um, 
Central America, in and around Mexico for thousands of years, the Maya used the mushroom we know, the, the Aztecs used the mushroom we know, and various other cultures in and around Mexico. Um, and it's just a fascinating story because it was the West or Europeans in the West didn't know about this until Gordon Wasson in the 1950s uh, discovered these secret mushroom ceremonies going on in Oaxaca in Mexico. So the, the whole history of the mushroom is fascinating. And what's even more fascinating is that when it was first, when Wasson wrote his famous Life magazine article about psilocybin mushrooms in, I think that came out in 1957, which mm -hmm. is still within living memory. Um, people would flock to Mexico to find these mushrooms and, and people just did not know that they, we now know there's, there's a, a, about 200 species worldwide, um, but they were not, as far as we know, they weren't, they might have been used thousands of years ago in Europe. There's no hard evidence of that yet. Um, but they, we didn't we didn't know about it it was a new thing and people in the uh, late 50s and early 60s would go down to mexico to try and uh, secure um to secure to secure samples of this mushroom not knowing that they grow all over the planet you know they've been documented documented uh, everywhere now so the hi the history of the mushroom and where it grows and how it's been used is is fascinating what was your what was your connection with the amantia uh, muscaria and christianity i found that interesting in your book fly agaric mushrooms well i did, i tried uh the first mushroom i ever tried was actually the fly agaric mushroom it's the uh, big red and spotted uh, red red white spots um I, n I never managed to get an effect from them. Um, from what I've read, they shouldn't be confused with psilocybin mushrooms because the psychoactivity is completely different. Mm -hmm. They're not even classed as a, a psychedelic. Um, I think they're classed as a hypnotic or, or something like that. Um, so m my my main area of focus is the psilocybin mushroom and not, and not the the fly agaric mushroom. But you do you do mention a connection between Christianity and a link between Jesus and uh, this, I, I don't, I'm not sure. I don't remember the the name of the person that you mentioned that started this th theory, but basically that uh, the Holy Grail was actually this this fly agaric mushroom, Amantia muscaria, and Christianity and Jesus is kind of centered around around that. Yeah, that's not an area of focus. I I, I steer clear of that. I don't. Uh, there's a lot of uh, no comment type questions. Well, no, not no comment. It's just it's not. It, I'm not. I don't buy into those notions of uh, because the, it, because of the psychoactivity of the fly agaric. If you go on Arrowhead and look John at John Allegro, is the name. Yeah, yeah. If you go on uh, Arrowhead and look at people's uh, experiences with the fly agaric, it's often you know it's often <laughs> unpleasant. It has a um, n uh, unpleasant effects on the body and it is, it's totally different to the tryptamines and the tryptamines are psilocybin uh, things like psilocybin and ayahuasca for instance they're mm -hmm. what I would call the true psychedelics um, and the fly agaric the, the active ingredient um, muscarine I think it is, is is totally different to the tryptamines so I've never bought into those theories that uh, yeah, that you just spoke about okay so let's let's move on here so I mean, where do you see yourself moving towards with with this work? I mean, how how do you distinguish yourself and versus other people who've done this? I mean, Terence McKenna wrote Food of the Gods, and so you're you're kind of writing about psilocybin. But where do you see your work going within the next ten years or so? Well, my main area of focus now, um, um, what I'm interested in the most is this natural intelligence paradigm as i as i say in the, the new book the thing i the main thing i got from well, it's about 25 years of research now with psilocybin um the main thing or the gift in inverted collars i felt in inverted commas that i think i received as it were is this natural intelligence paradigm and i'm very keen to uh promote the notion that evolving life is is an intelligence. And I think it's important because we need to learn from that intelligence and we're at a crucial juncture of human history. And uh, we need to, if human culture is to sustain itself, right? You're, you hear a lot about sustainability all the time now. 
Um, well, life, life's been around for almost four billion years and it's learned the art of sustainability. So there's a tremendous amount of wisdom within organisms, within ecosystems and the relationship, symbiotic relationships between organisms. And I used to think about this and feel this a lot during my psilocybin experiences and that's what I want to, I'm concentrating on. It's the natural intelligence paradigm. And, uh, and when I talk about natural intelligence, I don't even have to talk about psilocybin. I mean, I can talk about psilocybin because it was a creative inspiration behind, behind uh, my current work, but um, it's, a, it's a subject unto itself. So that's the, the so thing. So let's I'm define just, that. What is, what is natural intelligence? Well, you can you can uh, contrast it with artificial intelligence if you think of clever robots and, and that kind of thing, clever computer systems. Natural intelligence is, I would call it, it's the intelligence of life itself, that life, particularly the fact that life evolves and that it's so flexible and plastic, that it's an intelligence. And it's not just, I mean, a tr the traditional scientific view would be that life is pretty much mindless and essentially purposeless and that nature is essentially purposeless and that life is just um, interesting stuff but it's not just interesting stuff it's in it's, it's it is interesting stuff but it's interesting stuff that behaves in a specific way and the specific way in which living things behave and biologic behaves it's it's intelligent because the remember the root uh, meaning of intelligence is to it means intelliger, which means to uh, choose between. So evolution through natural selection is the uh, the persistent uh, selection of of sensible choices. So so when Darwin defined evolution as descent with modification, I, I would say it's more a case of descent by way of sensible modifications. And as soon as you use the word sensible, that leads into intelligence. And uh, so my, my, uh, what I'm claiming is, is that the evolving life is an intelligence unto itself. And um, it's, this, it shouldn't be confused with creationism because creationists, when they talk about intelligent design, they're inferring an intelligence outside of nature. I'm saying nature itself is an intelligent system. I mean, was there, is there anything in your experience that you would say is that defined, like perhaps defined um, your thinking? Uh, I mean, was there any one experience that changed the way that you think about the nature of things? When, uh, well, it was mainly the natural intelligence thing came, derived from being in forests under the influence of psilocybin that I'd picked in the vicinity. Um, so it's just a, a matter of time spent in a, uh, an ecstatic, blissful state of mind, feeling very, very close uh, with the natural environment, feeling in communion with the natural environment and really sensing that the whole system was, there was an intelligence to it. So it's, yeah, it's from my psilocybin, the inspiration, but behind the natural intelligence paradigm that I promote came from my psilocybin experiences out in nature. So what, I mean, what can we do? How can we connect back into the sense of nature? And I mean, we've disconnected from it. We suffer from technology and um, this urban sort of crisis. So how do we connect back into nature? I mean, how do we move towards this reconnection? Well, I mean, I, mean, I mentioned a few. You can have arguments and you use rhetoric but um education is very important at the end of my latest the magic mushroom explorer book i mean i talk about things as simple as seeing the uh seeing the milky way i mean i think i read somewhere once that about 50 percent of people now because most of us live in cities never see the milky way so something as basic as seeing which our ancestors would have seen it all the time you know they would have been connected to the bigger picture because they would have been perceiving the bigger the splendid the splendid the the glory of the bigger picture every night um so because of you know we need to do something about light pollution and i think children need to be taken out to places where they can you know on school trips or whatever in the early evening in in the um at certain times of the year so they can go stargaze uh, so things like that and uh, we need more parks we need more roads shut down and converted into strips you know like uh, i was in 
Central Park recently in New York. I love Central Park. I mean, it's, it's beautiful that you've got this park with beautiful birds slap bang in the middle of you know, New York City. But it needs to be extended. You know, you need like larger roads uh, shut down and converted into strips of, uh, of, of woodland or whatever. So we need more green greenery. We need uh, more green roofs. You think of all the roofs of buildings you know that they're just bare we need you know if you look if you're in an aircraft flying over a city it looks doesn't look very organic so we need to turn make cities more organic so i think green roofs having living living walls and living uh, roofs is a good idea basically culture needs to become more organic if it's to fit in with the rest of the biosphere it needs to become more organic and we you're right we have an obsession with human technology at the moment and we're just buried in our looking at our, you know, iPhones. smartphones and yeah. stuff and, you know, people tripping over <laughs> the mess we've created kind of thing, you know. So, um, yeah, it's important we get back to nature because we have to – I'm sure one day, all being well, we will go to the stars and human consciousness, consciousness will spread out. Um, but we need a firm footing. You know, the ladder has to be kind of strong. The base that we set off from needs to be solid and healthy. Only when you've got a solid – and healthy, that's the key word, base, can you leap forward kind of thing. So we really need to repair our relationship with the biosphere. And that, that's why I bang on about this natural intelligence paradigm, because part of the problem is the way we conceive of life on Earth. We don't see it in the right way, I don't think. So there's a lot of things that can be done. Just Even just talking about it is a good thing. Right, right. So you, you wrote, and I found this interesting, you wrote in uh, your book, Darwin's Un Unfinished Business, you wrote about how evolution is not just about survival of the fittest, but also must include clever and sensible behavior. What is, I mean, what does that mean? What would be an example of clever and sensible behavior be? Well, that's, that's what I was saying earlier on. It's sensible. Like I said, Darwin defined evolution as descent with modification, but it's really descent via sensible modifications. The genetic changes, the changes in the genetic code that are selected by nature that are nourished by nature and preserved by nature, which is a larger environment, are those changes that lead to some kind of life-affirming behavior in the art of living and being. And the, to, to, to improve the art of living and being, behavior has to change in a sensible way. This is why, and at the moment, human culture doesn't is not sensible in the context of the rest of the biosphere. So this word sensible is very important. But as a basic example uh, of intelligence, um, think of a, a slime mold as this organism, and they found that if you put it, it's, it's like a mushroom, but it's not a, it's like a fungus, but it's not a fungus. They found you can put it in a maze with food in the middle and it will explore, it will send out tendrils to all parts of the maze. The tendrils that don't lead to anywhere sensible, there's no food there, they kind of wither. The tendril that makes it to the centre and explores the centre where the food is, that becomes preserved and the, the, the slime mould will concentrate its uh, structure into a direct route to the food at the centre of the maze. And when they've they did these experiments recently and it was hailed as an example of intelligence without a nervous system and it was made headlines in Nature magazine, you know, intelligence in a really primitive organism. Um, but that's an, a good example of sensible behaviour that uh, doesn't need to be conscious but it's sensible behaviour. So what nature constantly preserves is sensible behaviour, you know, better metabolism, Better vision, better hearing, better running ability, better ability to find water if you're a plant, better ability to synthesize enzymes. It's always to do with sensible, life-affirming changes. And when you think about that and you embrace that idea, that leads into this notion that it's intelligence. And that's what intelligence is. We're intelligent because we can make sense of our environment and uh Life is the same. Life has learned to make sense of gravity, to make sense of the laws of physics, to make sense of the laws of chemistry. The whole thing is in, is in intelligence. So hum, human intelligence is the latest uh, offshoot of this. Uh, hum, human consciousness and human intelligence is built on a, a huge pyramid of already existing intelligence which is the biosphere. So how much, how much would you say that our lack of understanding of, of this process or, or maybe we forgot that we were connected to the biosphere, maybe through we, all this technology and all this advancement that we've, 
we've disconnected from nature somehow. Well, we have. It's not. It's, it's not like a, a suggestion. We have disconnected disconnected from nature that's why we're suffering from global warming and all these environmental crises you know um this is there's no you know that's not new that's it's, it's we're waking up to this more and more that we live in a <clears throat> that human culture is totally the way i think about it it's like we've cocooned ourselves in these urban environments that are just full of you know the value system that that is nourished within these urban environments all to do with making money and advertising and you know it's just human ideas everywhere we've got basically mankind has his head up his own ass you right. know we, we don't we've lost this connection with the life support system because not only is the biosphere naturally intelligent it's a life support system the the air that you're breathing now and the air that i'm breathing now well you know the, you know Apple don't make that air. You know, Sony don't make it. These big corporations don't make fresh oxygen. You know, I'd, it comes from uh, the huge forests that are still around that's the, that circle the northern hemisphere and uh, you get algae in the ocean. You know, the, 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 the biosphere is, is a life support system. It sustains itself. And there are all these very complex cycles that we don't understand yet and symbiotic relationships, huge webs of symbiotic uh, natural intelligence that we we were only beginning to acknowledge and we've just like i say we've we've just cocooned ourselves away from that we think we can just do anything we like build anything we like burn as much fossil fuel as we like without realizing where fossil that fossil fuel was produced by naturally the natural naturally intelligent activity of photosynthesizing plants we've just used we like uh, immature uh children bl you know blundering about and you know pulling up things and there ah, we can do this we can do that without um any any awareness of the larger life support system which even now is sustaining us as we destroy that life support system so we really need to wake up to the the wisdom that that uh, is inherent within the rest of life and within the rest of the biosphere and uh, if you can't grok that then take some psilocybin mushrooms and maybe you can you know <laughs> i agree completely that we are kind of trapped and i think we've we've laid out the problem and we're we're kind of we've we've demonstrated that and we've built that so what is the solution i mean how do we move towards more green things around us. I mean, how can we consciously, not just by talking about it, but how can we practically, how can we use action to do these things? Well, I think one of the, one of the good was signs in the right direction is the biomimicry movement. Are you aware of the biomimicry movement? No. <clears throat> the biomimicry movement, they've got a, an institute, biomimicry institute. Um, biomimicry means uh, their, their definition of the biomimicry movement is the conscious emulation of nature's genius which is natural intelligence in, in other words the conscious emulation of nature's genius so they're looking at uh, engineering solutions by looking at how nature does things so that's a step in the right direction we need to look to nature to learn how nature does things how life does things how life uses energy how life recycles how input become how output becomes input and this kind of thing so there's a lot of, there's a lot of people working on this and um yeah i mean energy we need to chat we're still <clears throat> addicted to fossil fuels and in the uk they recently gave the go-ahead for the first fracking operation and i was thinking man it's like a it's like a, a cigarette addict who's dying of lung cancer and instead of switching to a electronic cigarette or giving up tobacco altogether is ripping up the floorboards to try and find little bits of tobacco that are down there you know so fracking is the same it's a desperate attempt to squeeze as much fossil fuel out of the <clears throat> biosphere as possible and that's not the right direction you know so our energy you know we we really have to to switch to um you know green renewable forms of energy and such so um yeah, there's all kind of green movements working on this, uh, you know, who are aware of this. And you've got a, an interest in permaculture now and people getting off the grid. And um, Yeah, I just, I, I quickly looked this up and I guess Velcro is an example of biomimicry. Yeah, well, they, they, there's, there's all manner of things. They've, you know, you can look at uh, 
think how much energy is used in um, air conditioning in hot countries. You know, there's a tremendous amount of electricity used and therefore has a high carbon footprint. But, you know, you look at a termite mound, it remains air conditioned and a, a relatively low temperature because the termites would die otherwise. And, you know, it's not plugged into, into anywhere. It's all done through water evaporation and, you know, the actual structure and stuff. So li life really is ingenious. It's, it's, it's figured out all kinds of uh, wonderful uh, ways of uh, using energy and, you know, and um, achieving homeostasis and a healthy, uh, a, a healthy um constitution so um we you know we need to be looking to, to we can learn there's wis there's wisdom in the rest of life we're not the only species you know there's and life has been around for four billion years so it must be doing something right you know forests you get forests that uh, i've been in the philippines i visited forests that were apparently about 60 million years old and it, it they weren't messy you know how did this survive for 60 million years without without humans with clipboards overseeing everything. You know, it works on its own because life, that's what evolution does. It, it, it works out how to do things. So we really need, my point is, it's our, my point is that our relationship with the biosphere, with the rest of nature at the moment is wanting and we need to readdress that. Uh, relationship because it's not healthy at the moment. Simon, we're approaching the end here, man. Um, where can people find your work? Uh, well, you can just uh, my website simongpowell.com. All my stuffs on there, books and interviews and films I've made and stuff. So, uh, is there anything it, you're currently working on? Yeah, I'm, it's been eight years since I made a film, but I've just begun filming some people to make a uh, making a. Well, I said earlier, I'm natural intelligence is my main thing, but I've got a a, a last film I want to make about psilocybin, looking at the res, the resurgence in psilocybin research, psilocybin science. So I'm making. I've just begun filming for a, a new documentary about the the, the mushroom. All right, Simon. Well, I really, really appreciate your time, sir. Thank you so much for being here. This is The Human Experience. We are going to get out of here. We will see you guys next week. Thank you so much for listening.